Thanks to all uh, who have joined. We are just waiting for others to come into the broadcast and we'll start momentarily. Once again, uh, for those who have joined, thanks so much for being here. We will wait just another minute to allow uh, other participants to join and then we'll get underway. Excellent. Uh, for those who have joined, you may see that you have a Q&A button on your screen where you can uh, ask questions or suggestions that we'll address uh, throughout the presentation here today. And I just want to uh, identify that our colleague Heidi from the Sierra State Parks Foundation uh, signed on and said, it is snowing in uh, at Lake Tahoe and Donner Lake. So that's great news for us all, I think. Well, so let's get underway. Again, thanks for being here. My name is Wade Crowfoot and I uh, have the honor of serving as our California Natural Resources Secretary. And today we'll spend the next hour talking about the priorities we have within the Secretary's office uh, and how we hope it's advancing uh, work that you're engaged in. We're joined today by employees from across our agency as well as uh, all manner of external partners, whether that's an environmental conservation group or community-based organization or legislative staff or businesses that are impacted by the work that we do at Natural Resources. So uh, we're glad you're here today. Also a note that this is being recorded for those who are not able to join us live. And then lastly, as I mentioned, there is a Q&A button on the screen. And throughout this presentation, if you have questions or suggestions or observations you wanna share, please type it into the Q&A. The first half, I'll be providing a, a presentation, a, a PowerPoint uh, deck as, as I go through our priorities. And then we're, we're going to invite some of our policy staff in the secretary's office to join on screen and uh, we'll answer your questions and engage in a discussion. So bear with me, I'm just trying to get the, there we are. Uh, so as probably most of you know, the Natural Resources Agency is quite a large agency, almost 30 separate departments, commissions, and conservancies across our agency, literally spread across California's geography. Uh, from our largest department, Cal Fire, with over 7,000 employees, to the small but mighty San Joaquin River Conservancy with three employees. Um, we have many different types of organizations within the agency. And obviously our, our teams across the agency are engaged in myriad different projects or programs uh, and advancing their own specific missions. Our goal here today is not to catalog all the good work or the priorities across the agency, but simply to identify the priorities that we're driving uh, within the secretary's office that we actually think bind work uh, across the agency. Now I wanna first recognize that the last year 2020 has been very hard uh, on all of us. Several thousand Californians lost their home, homes to catastrophic wildfire. Tens of thousands of California families lost a father or mother, or sister or brother uh, to COVID. And we've all been navigating um, the fear and the uncertainty and the anxiety uh, for several months. So I wanna start off by thanking you. Uh, if you are an employee in our agency, you have uh, demonstrated remarkable resilience, staying focused uh, on the mission 
uh, and uh, our, uh, all the work we do to serve California. For some, that meant maintaining your post in the field at a state park as a fish and game warden, as a, as a wildlife biologist, as a firefighter or as a California Conservation Corps member keeping food moving throughout our food banks. For many of us, that meant shifting our work environment to the kitchen table or the dining room table and staying focused despite all of the challenges uh, that our country and our state faces, staying focused on the, the work of our agency. Uh, and if you're an external partner, no doubt you maintained um, that perseverance as well. So I wanna just acknowledge the tremendous work um, that, can, that has continued through throughout uh, the last year and, and thank you uh, on behalf of the agency and on behalf of Governor Newsom. Now look, I think and I hope you agree that brighter days are ahead. Uh, it's not that we uh, shifted uh, into January 1st and everything changed, but um, we're seeing uh, progress uh, in the return towards normalcy. I do wanna touch on progress that the state is making regarding the fight against the pandemic. Uh, this photo identifies the first person in our state to be vaccinated. Uh, in only a handful of weeks, we've achieved three and a half million vaccinations in the state. I think today was the first day where we now have more folks vaccinated uh, in recent weeks than Californians that have contracted the virus over the last year. Uh, this chart uh, demonstrates or identifies the number of new cases in the state and and clearly points out a very concerning spike uh, around the holidays, but also um, the stabilizing of new cases uh, more recently. I also wanna highlight a new website that our agencies uh, have rolled out called myturn.ca.gov to help you understand uh, when you'll be eligible for the vaccine and actually to get uh, an update or contacted um, when you're eligible to receive the vaccine. Now, this. Uh, New Year, or 2021, I should say, also marks um, the move of our agency into a new building in Sacramento. Only 20% of our agency's employees will be in this new headquarters. About half of our agency employees are in Sacramento, and the other half are across the state. And those that are in Sacramento, only about half of those in Sacramento, a little under half, will be in the new uh, headquarters. Uh, but we're using uh, our opportunity as the first agency that is moving into a new headquarters building uh, to update the way that we're doing our work. And if you're an employee across our agency, you'll learn more about this in coming weeks and months. But we're really trying to, as Governor Newsom and so many others have said, build back better, uh, take lessons learned from the pandemic and use it to improve our workplace. So we've developed uh, five pillars that are orienting what we believe is an improvement to the way that we're going to work. Uh, prioritizing flexi flexibility and autonomy, uh, introducing more teleworking or remote working in, uh, into the, the weekly routine, even after we come back from the pandemic, uh, more flexible hours where possible. In other words, enabling people to maintain productivity, but in a more flexible way. And we'll develop better ways of working as managers and leaders to really lead this more flexible workplace, which includes uh, innovating and finding ways to work uh, maybe in, in, in new ways and less traditional ways. Um, we want to ensure that our offices, whether they're the headquarters or in, a, in an office anywhere in the state, uh, enable this new uh, updated approach to working. Um, so that will mean in the headquarters, more common meeting space, more flexible workspace for folks to use, considering more people will be teleworking on a regular basis. Um, and we think a workplace that's filled with more uh, energy and collaboration than a traditional workplace. Our goal working with our partners at, uh, Cal, uh, at DGS and the Government Operations Agency is to provide a model of a new way of working across the agency. So we're excited about that. Other points of progress in the new year are, of course, the governor's proposed budget. Uh, that is really, from my perspective, the administration's most important policy document of the year. He proposed this budget on January 8th, and the legislature is currently uh, considering it. And while it, the, the primary thrust was recovering from COVID and uh, restarting our, our economic prosperity or maintaining our economic prosperity, major investments were made in the proposed budget and our environment and natural resources. 
Uh, whether it's a billion dollars for wildfire resilience or 400 plus million dollars for uh, our, our efforts to better manage our natural and working lands, flood safety investments, uh, important investments in equitable access that we'll talk today, et cetera. Um, major proposed investments, and we're excited to engage the legislature on this. Also, of course, a, a, a point of optimism is the pre President Biden's announcement last week of uh, uh, his climate executive order, uh, which in many ways, uh, I think, mirrors uh, actions that have been taken in California in recent years, whether that's setting a specific uh, carbon emission reduction target, uh, establishing a 30 by 30 goal for the country to conserve 30% of land by 2030, more on that in a little bit, uh, or to elevate and emphasize the importance of, of prioritizing disadvantaged communities or communities most vulnerable to climate change, both through applying something similar to EnviroScreen that we have in California to identify uh, vulnerable communities at the national level and to target 40% of climate investments going into those most disadvantaged communities. So we're really excited to roll up sleeves and work with the new administration in weeks to come. Now, what does this, all this context mean for uh, our priorities within the agency? And so I wanna identify sort of three cross-cutting priorities that are animating our work. The first is building our climate resilience. The governor was clear in the fall that we need to double down on climate action. Uh, and so in our world, in our natural resources agency, that means uh, doing more to protect people and nature from the impacts of climate change. Illustrated by this photo of a prescribed burn uh, occurring where members of the Yurok and Pitt River tribes uh, were applying traditional burning practices toward maintaining the health of forests in the northern portion of our state. This activity is emblematic of the work that we need to do to advance climate resilience and, of course, the importance of integrating in partnership with tribes traditional ecological knowledge in all of our climate resilience work. Now, we know as Californians that climate impacts are accelerating, whether that's flooding in San Jose uh, uh, identified here in 2017 or the Paradise Fire, coastal erosion, drought, or even uh, greater LA reaching over 120 degrees this summer. Uh, the fact is that climate change is creating uh, worsening threats in our state. And that means we have to redouble our efforts to strengthen our climate resilience. So how are we doing this? At the natural resource, at the agency level, uh, one key function of ours is to prioritize specific actions we can take to shore up this resilience from these worsening threats to ensure that actions are coordinated within our agency, but also across our agencies. And so identified here are some key strategic documents that we're really using as action plans to hold ourselves accountable for strengthening this resilience. Uh, both our water resilience portfolio that was issued uh, last year, our strategic plan to protect California's coasts and oceans, including from sea level rise and coastal erosion, uh, our recently released action plan to build our wildfire resilience, and then across our agencies, various plans, including the Delta Stewardship Council's recent uh, release of its Delta ADAPTS climate resilience framework for the Sacramento-San Joaquin Bay Delta. We're also, thanks to the California Energy Commission, developing this pathway to 100% renewable energy by 2035. Through the work of our Department of Conservation uh, and CalGEM, strengthening oversight of the fossil fuel extraction uh, that occurs in our state. We're advancing a, a new strategy to uh, identify how we better manage our natural and working lands to both uh, remove carbon from the atmosphere and build our climate resilience. And then this year, in uh, I think a very, very exciting uh, effort is to tie all of these sectoral efforts together through an update to our climate adaptation strategy, which is a statutory requirement that our agency has to update the state's adaptation plan every three years. Now, I, I can say this, uh, a few of us, uh, Chief Porter from Cal Fire, myself in the picture, found ourselves in this surreal uh, circumstance of standing up for climate action and, and science uh, with President Trump earlier this fall. 
And I just share this photo to say um, that with our governor, with our legislative leaders, uh, California will continue to stand up for the science that we know to be true um, that's driving these climate risks and the actions that we need to take. The second prior priority I wanna highlight is maintaining our biodiversity across the state, our natural variety, our natural richness of plants and animals, part of the identity of who we are as Californians. California is one of the most biodiverse places in the world, as this heat map of biodiversity indicates. California has been recognized by scientists as one of 36 biodiversity hotspots across the planet, places with exceptional natural variety or natural richness, but that also are experiencing significant threats to that natural richness. In California, we have over 5,500 species of plants and animals, 40% of which only exist in California. To date, we've been protecting that biodiversity through our Endangered Species Acts, both on the state and federal level. And those are critical to avoid the extinction of animals. But I compare that to a healthcare policy that only invested in emergency room medicine. If we're going to keep our natural environment healthy, we need to do more before species are on the brink of extinction. So we are establishing the California Biodiversity Collaborative, which is essentially an inclusive forum of not only state agencies and federal and local agencies, but groups um, uh, fr ranging from academic institutions, to natural history museums, to environmental conservation groups, to uh, agricultural associations, industry associations, to identify, hey, how are we gonna work together to keep California's biodiversity healthy? And here you see four pillars of the collaborative, understand, protect, engage, and empower. And to find out more about this collaborative, you can go on biodiversity.ca.gov. We're also advancing this goal to protect 30% of California's land and coastal waters by 2030, uh, the so-called 30 by 30 conservation goal. The governor set this goal earlier this fall, and that was actually based on an effort that was advanced by our legislative colleagues uh, to establish a 30 by 30 goal in California. This is part of an international movement to protect 30% of the planet by 2030. And we're really excited about what this could mean for the next decade of uh, conservation in California. And we recognize that uh, defining what we mean by conservation is really important. And so colleagues will spend the next year working across the state uh, with stakeholders to really build this pathway to reach 30 by 30. The third priority is expanding equitable access for all Californians. The fact is we live in an incredible state with remarkable natural richness and also tremendous cultural and historical richness that can't be enjoyed uh, by all Californians. Uh, some of us have the benefit of being able to access nature fairly easily, while others can't based on where they live or their means. Governor Newsom talks a lot about internally and externally about building a California for all. And so in our agency, we're focused on ensuring access for all. This means that prioritizing and shifting investments to get more resources to allow uh, folks across the state to encounter, engage, enjoy our natural outdoors, like these first time surfers in San Diego. It also means that ensuring that the places we maintain and the stories we tell, tell all of our stories in California, as evidenced by one state park that we're working to restore, Colonel Allensworth State Park in the Central Valley that commemorates the founding of an independent African-American community of ranching and farming at the turn of the century, 1908, um, that allowed uh, African-Americans to prosper amidst uh, historic racism and discrimination. We need to do more of this. It also means looking ourselves in the mirror, uh, catalyzed by civil rights protests last spring, to understand how do we make our institutions more equitable? How do we address systemic inequity in our own institutions? And in the Natural Resources Agency, that means uh, doing more to listen and understand perspectives that are not our own, commit to making change, and then acting to make change. 
And this involves everything from redressing uh, historically discriminatory names in our parks and our natural places to ensuring that our workforce across the agency better reflects the full diversity of California. It also means actually institutionalizing equity and environmental justice within our own office, the secretary's office and across our agency. And I'm excited that we're uh, in the process of recruiting our first ever assistant secretary for equity and environmental justice. So climate resilience, biodiversity, access for all are three priorities. And they'll advance in part through an executive order that Governor Newsom issued uh, late last year uh, focused on advancing nature-based solutions. He actually visited Sierra Orchards, which is a sustainable orchard on the uh, county border of Yolo and, and, uh, and uh, boy, I think in, in Yolo County, um, that is focused on uh, growing crops and in maintaining a sustainable environment. So we use that location as an opportunity to launch this executive order, which is all about expanding our use of nature to tackle climate change and these other challenges. A few examples uh, clockwise from on left, the Yolo Bypass, which is a major floodplain where the Sacramento River overtops a weir during the winter and pushes water into this historic floodplain, both to protect the safety of Sacramento and provide remarkable environmental habitat for endangered salmon. It's also work like planting hedgerows to the upper right uh, along agricultural fields to maintain pollinator diversity or lower right to do more work in our upper watersheds, uh, maintaining healthy forests uh, to protect the supply and the quality of our water. And it's also lower left urban greening projects that work to bring more green into urban communities to provide for uh, cooling off of neighborhoods from extreme heat, maintaining biodiversity within an urban context and improving the quality of life uh, for folks in large cities. We're gonna advance this executive order uh, many ways, including through 30 by 30 and the Biodiversity Collaborative and the Climate Smart Working Land strategies that I noted. We're also gonna develop a geospatial platform that will be available to the public that we think is gonna be the most integrated and sophisticated uh, data tool or data system to identify the needs and the opportunities across the state. Uh, both to maintain biodiversity, uh, sequester carbon, and achieve other environmental goals. And we're really thankful to be partnering with ESRI uh, on this effort. We'll also be involved in a range of partnerships uh, indicated here in these, these photographs to actually advance nature-based solutions, whether that's the recent MOU with NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory to use satellite data to improve our understanding of our environment in California, or the middle picture to work with the Landscape Stewardship Network and other partners to cut the green tape. In other words, to make it more cost-effective and efficient uh, to uh, deliver environmental restoration projects. And then the slide on the right, uh, who uh, is a photo of the uh, highest level climate or diplomat at the United Nations, Elizabeth Marumba Maremba, uh, who's driving the UN Convention on Biodiversity. That's a partnership we're now engaged in, and for the first time, the state of California will be a formal participant in the effort to develop uh, a essentially like an international agreement on biodiversity through the United Nations. Now, in this work, we have a number of key challenges, and I didn't want to paint an overly rosy photo of, of the work we're engaged in, so I did want to highlight some of the key challenges. First, of course, we are still dealing with uh, the threat of COVID, and um, most of us are working from home almost entirely, or if we're in the field, we're taking precautions. Our, our work is not normal and won't be for at least the near future. Uh, at the same time, we know that climate change uh, and its impacts are accelerating in California, evidenced by this photo of Highway 1 washing out in the most recent atmospheric river last week. So all of this other work that we do uh, must be done as these climate threats uh, compound. Many of our departments uh, need more consistent, adequate ongoing funding. And I'll highlight the Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as our California State Parks Department, or our Department of Parks and Recreation, 
two departments that rely on general fund that over uh, time in recent decades have seen reduced levels of general fund. Our Department of Fish and Wildlife is on the verge or just completed its service-based budgeting analysis, which identifies a major gap in the resources that has and its statutory mission. The one thing I'm focused on in the next year or two is working with our Department of Finance and our legislative colleagues to identify uh, more consistent funding sources for some of the key functions of departments across our agency. And then the last two bullet points are pretty obvious, but bear note, uh, which is it does take time and cost to actually get everything done that we want to get done. Uh, and so we're working and focused every day uh, to make progress on these priorities, recognizing that the time uh, in these roles for people like me is actually fairly limited. And we rely on the career professionals in our departments and agencies to make this progress. And then of course, the ebb and flow of priorities, which can typically be a problem. But I have to say that our governor and our legislative leaders um, are committed to the priorities that I've articulated here. And I'm just really thankful of the leadership and partnership of, uh, of those policymakers to actually advance our work. I want to emphasize that in this work uh, here over the next year, we're going to be developing and we're prioritizing developing ideas together. Uh, whether you're an employee, if you're an employee within uh, the agency, actually empowering you to help us solve the challenges that we've identified and the priorities uh, we've identified. Um, but if you're, a, if you're somebody outside of the state agency or outside of government, we want your ideas and we want your engagement. Um, so you'll, uh, if you haven't already, you'll hear more from us about the different ways to engage in all of these different initiatives. And our, our commitment is inclusive, collaborative conversations, government to government consultations with tribes across the state, engagement that's regionalized, recognizing that needs and opportunities differ greatly across the state, and transparent decision making. Uh, which is obviously a principle across our administration. At the end of the day, I'll steal a tagline from a partner organization, the Pisces Foundation, and tell you that you know, I'm committed to uh, advancing all of this work um, with people and nature together. Obviously, our agency has a clear mission to protect and restore the natural environment, and we're going to do that. And that will occur uh, in parallel or integrated with our efforts to expand economic equity and maintain prosperity, to address other key goals we have across the state like housing creation, and to ensure that all Californians uh, can actually recreate in California and benefit from this incredible natural environment. So lastly, I'll say onward. And I think we took this photo from a partner organization, Latino Outdoors, and to me, it indicates um, or emphasizes or symbolizes the journey that we're on. This is really a shared effort of uh, like-minded Californians uh, across the state to advance all of this work together. So I'm really excited with the work we have in, uh, to do in the coming year. It definitely builds on so much of your work uh, in over the last year, but over the last several years and decades. Uh, and I'm committed uh, to doing as much as we can from within the secretary's office to lift up the good work happening across our agency and happening across our state. So thanks very much. At this point, what, I'll, what we'll do is ask uh, those of you uh, who are, are joining here today, and we're actually just up to 750 participants, to share any questions or observations you have in the Q&A function uh, on your screen. And I'll ask my colleague James to bring down the presentation and to bring on uh, our policy staff uh, within the secretary's office uh, to help uh, answer the questions here today. Um, so as we bring on the team, I see I'll introduce folks as they come on the screen. Uh, we have Amanda Hansen, our deputy on all things climate, Nancy Vogel uh, on all things water, Angela Barranco, our fearless leader, our undersecretary, uh, helping me to lead the entire agency, Mark Gold on Oceans and Coasts, Jen Norris, a newly created positions on biodiversity and, and habitat, 
Andrea Ambriz, who we actually recruited, hired and onboard, onboarded during COVID, uh, who leads our external and intergovernmental affairs. So let me ask you, uh, Mark, the first question I saw, which is uh, from Kendall. Um, one thing that concerns me is that sea level rise isn't mentioned at all in the governor's budget this year. This is a huge threat to our state. Hoping you can comment on um, what we're doing uh, to build our resilience to sea level rise. Um, so there, there's still a lot going on. I, so from the OPC perspective, uh, we have our next meeting. What's the OPC perspective? We're going to be an acronym-free zone here today. Oh, then I will be kicked out in about two seconds. Ocean Protection Council um, is having their meeting on the 16th, and an item on there um, is uh, uh, the expenditure of between seven and eight million dollars for coastal resilience projects. So that um, people forget that we have bonds let, um, that are still in play, Prop 68 um, in this particular case. And so that's um, one significant investment. Um, we also uh, uh, spearheaded by Secretary Crowfoot and Sec Secretary Blumenfeld um, put together sea level rise principles uh, last year. Um, and about 17 different departments and agencies took part in putting together those principles. Um, those principles are enabling us to align our efforts as a state and departments in dealing with a wide variety of different sea level rise issues. We just started getting to the next part of that, which is, is how to actually make sure that the principles themselves are being implemented on a regular basis in the work that we do. Um, and then I'm sure everybody's looking at what's going on in the legislature. And there's a lot of action on sea level rise um, that's being discussed this year. And we'll see which of those bills make it to the finish line, but um, definitely a top, a top priority in the legislature that um, our agency is uh, um, gonna be available to work with the elected officials um, on um, making sure that the legislation is, is useful for us. Thanks. So more to come on that, but if, if you want to see the principles we've established across state agencies on sea level resilience, you can log on to the Ocean Protection Council or Google California's sea level rise resilience principles. Um, so that's going to be the foundation of a lot of work. Question for you, Angela, um, from Caroline or Carolyn. Um, will telework open more opportunities to work outside of the region one lives in? For example, if you live in San Diego, could you potentially work a, you know, work in a job that's uh, technically in Sacramento? That's a great question, and, and thanks for bringing that up. You know, I think there's such incredible possibility in this new workplace that we are imagining as a result of COVID. And what I would say is, um, what's an interesting statistic is that we already have um, staffers who come from other parts of the state um, who are based in Sacramento, but traditionally it's been a bit challenging, right? So you have folks who have to travel, who have to, you know, make sure that they have an apartment in Sacramento and all the sort of logistics of being able to work in two different cities. You know, our hope um, and our encouragement is that in this uh, post-COVID new workplace, um, that there will be opportunities to do, um, just as you say, you know, that we will be able to have folks from all across the state serving within state government um, really effectively, you know, whether it's uh, joining people in this type of forum so you can speak to people from all over the state, but also vice versa, that we can collaborate, that we can work as teams, that um, we can effectively manage, um, you know, the work and the business of the state of California uh, together from any place we hope is really the, the goal of what we're doing. Um, you know, I will say that the one um, caveat to that I'll just add is, you know, of course, it'll be dependent on the team. Um, and folks may need, have necessity and in, in certain, um, you know, particular jobs um, to be location based. And so I'll just add that small caveat, um, but we're really excited for this new world um, and uh, look forward to the type of feedback that you give us. So thank you. Thanks so much, Angela. That's gonna be exciting to really broaden the, the talent that the state can uh, attract uh, and not to be restricted by geography. Um, Ian asked a question about this, this one-time funding for the Fish and, Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, what will it be used for? And uh, since I kind of committed that to memory um, for our budget presentation, let me share a couple of things. One is, you know, we recognize that Department of Fish and Wildlife um, will benefit from consistent ongoing funding, particularly to uh, expand staffing on critical statutorily required functions. 
At the same time, uh, while we have a lot of one-time budget as a result of a an increase in capital gains tax, our Department of Finance uh, projects an ongoing sort of budget deficit on our general fund over time, hence the uh, investment of one-time funding for, for Fish and Wildlife. So Chuck and Val and team at Fish and Wildlife have identified um, the, the use of the $41 million with um, uh, the thinking in mind, like where can one-time investments be made to improve efficiencies that can have sort of ongoing benefit. But areas of, um, of investment will include um, about $7 million in uh, improving human wildlife conflict response um, to strengthen education in local communities, um, expand equipment, um, that's going to protect uh, uh, animals and keep them separated from commu uh, human communities. Almost $10 million for improved uh, management of wetlands that DFW operates, um, improvement at, improvements at fish hatcheries, um, improving access uh, at the eco uh, ecosystem preserves um, that Fish and Wildlife has, um, and ensuring the right um, interpretive material that really addresses equitable access and then providing some equipment uh, to those in the field uh, to improve the efficiency of um, patrols to protect wildlife, et cetera, including um, air support and offshore patrol vessels. Um, so those are at least the proposed uh, investments. And again, that's before the, the legislature. Um, question from Joanna, which is, there are proposals to have an ecosystem restoration core at the national level. Um, and she's curious about um, how California would want to participate or lead the way, um, prioritizing tribal land care and stewardship and developing youth work skills um, in, in stewardship. Um, how would we roll this out in the state? Um, I'll take a first crack at that and just say that California now has uh, the nation's first climate action core that our Cal volunteers has organized. So if you Google Climate Action Core California, um, it includes both uh, opportunities for young adults through AmeriCorps to actually do climate organizing in communities, specifically vulnerable communities. Uh, and it also provides opportunities for regular people, you know, sort of people with regular jobs that don't, that, that can't devote all their time to this, but to actually volunteer to, um, to take climate action in their own lives. This ecosystem restoration core, I haven't heard specifically about, but I'm, I'm, I'd be interested in. Uh, in integrating or, or starting the conversation with Cal volunteers around how we could actually do something focused on specifically restoring habitat and the environment. Um, Matt Baker, you made it just in time. You're our energy person. Uh, and Jeffrey or Jeff asks, the, the California Energy Commission needs to invest in transmission infrastructure into the Northeast portion of our state. Um, we have wind, solar, geothermal, renewable energy that's currently untapped in this region. And by Northeast, I'm thinking probably the Modoc Plateau, um, you know, north of Sacramento and east of the five. Um, so what's your, what's your take on, you know, the state's uh, transmission planning and, and energy planning? We have a state, you know, target of 100% renewables by 2035. How can we enable a region like this to actually participate in that effort? Um, I, I think the best way for uh, the region to participate would be to engage with some of the transmission planning processes that are been uh, that are being kind of honchoed at the California Energy Commission. Um, getting in touch with uh, 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 Commissioner Karen Douglas, uh, I think, is a very good uh, first step. I think there's a lot of work that the counties can do to actually try to make. Uh, transmission siting uh, easier and quicker. Um, uh, as, the, as the person who asked the question may know, it's a very, very long uh, process that can often get very hung up on very, very local issues. Um, but, but I would just say it is, uh, you know, it is a top priority and for us to achieve the goals of SB 100, um, we're gonna have to build out to uh, uh, many different parts of the state. Um, it looks increasingly likely that we'll have to do work offshore, which will, uh, which presents different transmission challenges. Um, and it is probably one of the more important things that we need to get started on right now. Thanks, Matt. Uh, another Matt asks a question or makes a statement, Amanda, I'm gonna ask you to respond to. 
Um, regarding climate vulnerability assessments, we see disproportionate impacts on low-income communities of color. For example, the Delta Stewardship Council's climate vulnerability assessment identifies about 74% of the impacts of, uh, in San Joaquin County uh, and in poor communities there. Um, how are we ensuring that adaptation investments are uh, focused on vulnerable communities? He says, as we've seen from some of the climate investments or many of the climate investment programs that, uh, in, in the state, um, those get to communities that are more affluent. Uh, so he says, we need more than a quarter set aside for disadvantaged communities. So how would you respond to his points there? Yeah, well, I mean, I would, I would largely agree with the assertion that there are communities across California that are disproportionately going to be impacted by climate change, and we do not have a tool that helps us identify who those communities are. And so I would just point out that the um, Governor's Office of Planning and Research is uh, developing a platform that will uh, identify these climate vulnerable communities. That process is just uh, go, it's, I, I'm not even sure. I think they're hiring uh, for some support, but the process will be kicking off this year um, because we recognize that this is a critical question um, and that our investments need to protect the most vulnerable communities. So um, more to come in that space. And I, I think there'll be a lot of opportunity to engage in the process um, that OPR will be, will be kicking off in coordination with the resources agency and likely also Cal EPA. Um, and just secondly, I would flag that Wade mentioned the climate smart land strategy that our agency is tapped with coordinating. And, you know, one of the tools that we'll be uh, attempting to build out is uh, will help us sort of get that process going by identifying where are people most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change um, and where where might landscapes uh, be able to to uh, protect those those vulnerable people in places. So we're hoping to account for some of that um, uh, more social vulnerability in that process as well. So thanks for the question. Yeah, and I would just add, you know, the state has about a decade of experience in really identifying those communities that are most impacted by environmental pollution, and that's EnviroScreen. And as Amanda points out, it's, it's much uh, newer and potentially more complicated to identify, you know, which communities are most vulnerable to these various risks, wildfire, drought, flooding, et cetera. But Amanda, thanks for bringing up the fact that OPR is going to be developing essentially. Is that like an enviro screen for climate adaptation? Exactly. Okay. Um, Jan, I'm going to ask you a question from Chester. There's been little agreement on the international level um, at the international level on what it, what conserve means for goals like the 30 by 30 conservation goal or other targets set by the United Nations. What's our agency's opinion about the definition um, of conservation? whether we've conserved 30% of our land already because we have management plans or we've conserved very little because we're only counting those areas set aside from no human or consumptive use. So broadly, you know, how are we gonna tackle this question of what does it mean to, con you know, what's conserved land or water over the next year? I think that's the fundamental question that we want to answer as we move through this 30 by 30 process. We wanna to bring together people that have opinions on this question. It's it's not a simple thing to answer. I think there's categories of things that we know count, you know, things that are set aside and protected and, um, you know, already have biodiversity values in place. But there's lots of other opportunities to conserve nature across working lands, across different uh, ownership types. And so we want to have that conversation with the Biodiversity Collaborative, all the staff and participants across government to really hone in on that uh, definition for California. Thanks, Jen. Um, and while, while, while we're talking to you, a couple of other questions. Um, will the Cal Na California nature, that geospatial system be used to measure progress towards the 30 by 30 goal? And also, how will this California biodiversity initiative differ from an earlier approach in Jerry Brown's administration that was, uh, or that developed uh, called the California Biodiversity Council? So the first question is absolutely. The, the fundamental purpose of the CA nature system is to uh, identify how far we are along the path to 30% and be able to track that through time. So that's our fundamental goal and how that relates to all these other interrelated values of biodiversity conservation, climate resilience and access for all. Um, the second question is about the Biodiversity Council. Is that what you asked? Yeah. So the Biodiversity Collaborative is, is really our biodiversity initiative 
um, making partnerships a top priority. So the Biodiversity Council is in existence that's focused mainly on government, federal, state, and local governments sharing information. Um, we're gonna continue to tap that group as well as a group, the Biodiversity Network, which is uh, an organization of practitioners that has sprung up out of the 2018 uh, executive order, folks that have been working on biodiversity um, through time. So we're gonna be bringing both those groups together and anyone else that wants to be part of this inclusive process as we move forward implementing 30 by 30. Thanks so much. Andrea, this question is for you uh, about how will we plan to partner with the Department of Interior? They obviously have a really exciting uh, secretary nominee in Deb Holland, who is a congresswoman and uh, Native American leader from New Mexico. What's our plan to uh, collaborate with the Department of the Interior? Oh, we lost Andrea just in time here. Um, Andrea, are you able to hear us? Uh, she's, uh, I think her internet's looking a little spotty. So, um, We'll come back to her, her. Hey, Matt, question for you. Cassandra, I think, correct, corrected me that I talked about this pathway to 100% renewable energy. And she reminds us that the law calls for 100% to renewable and emission-free energy, which provides um, a pathway to a broader set of technologies. Can you just, one, confirm her correction of me on that and then share thoughts around sort of the suite of technologies that could help us meet our 2035 goal? Yeah, I, I, she is correct. And um, I think there are a number of places where we're thinking about uh, using newer technologies. Some of them are renewable, like wind uh, technology, which has a much higher capacity factor. Other ones like geothermal are a little bit more expensive, but also are available more on a base load capacity. And then finally, uh, the Environmental Commission or the Energy Commission is also looking at uh, potentially carbon capture. Um, as something to make to meet some of the final increments that hardest to abate uh, uh, technology or uh, uh, increments uh, to get to 100%. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult to get to 100%. So we're really going to need kind of as far as technologies go on all hands on deck. And then we'll also want to keep at least cost. Excellent. And for those of you who may just join us, who we have on the screen are uh, our, our, our key policy staff in the in the office of, of the secretary. So we have our water, our climate, biodiversity, energy, oceans and coast experts, as well as um, my co-leader of the agency, uh, Angela, and our uh, key intergovernmental leader, Andrea. So question, Andrea, your internet seems to have come back. Two questions. One, how are we planning to work with Department of the Interior? And then two, if, are we coordinating with the White House um, on this stuff? Oh, we're so excited of the new administration and the opportunities for us to engage collectively and um, collaboratively with them. Um, we have definitely been in touch with the um, incoming um, landing team over at the Department of Interior through um, kind of staff engagements. We're really looking forward to the nomination of the um, secretary nominee um, who um, the Biden administration has um, uh, selected. Uh, I think one of the most important elements to our engagement is to work not only with Congress and also our um, federal um, partners over at the White House and the um, agency, but also any other national organizations that will also continue to advocate on very similar priorities that we have. Um, as the Secretary raised a bit earlier, our uh, 30 by 30 uh, initiative is very similar to the recently announced Biden administration's um, 30 by 30 initiative. So um, that's one example of uh, similar um, focused areas that we're going to um, engage really closely on. Um, there are many different issues um, ranging from tribal affairs issues and engagement um, to the Bureau from the Bureau of Indian Affairs all the way to the US Forest Service. So across the board, we're planning to engage pretty closely and collaboratively. If others um, have suggestions or if there are any federal partners here on the line, would love to work with you. Please feel free to contact us. I also wanna mention, I dropped into the chat window, the uh, sign up link to any, um, or to our listserv. So if anybody would like to sign up and receive regular updates, please do that. And feel free to contact me for other ideas too. 
Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, and it's really our goal, whether you're an employee or a partner uh, outside of government, to, to do more of these types of conversations, and we're starting to do more. You can find out about those by joining this listserv. We promise you we won't blast you with emails. I think it's maybe the temple is about once a month, uh, unless you just keep up with our work. Um, Jen, question about how those interested can interact with the efforts to develop this California Nature platform. Are you going to be doing some sort of public workshop or something? How do people find out more about it? Yeah, definitely. So <clears throat> we have sort of a core team that is working right now to pull together authoritative sources from across government into one space and identify where those gaps are. But that's just a preliminary step. And our goal is to reach out to other folks within government. So if you're working with us, you might be hearing from folks saying, we would love to get your data if we know it exists. But then beyond that, we expect to have workshops and share that publicly and get feedback and find out where we are missing something and what else we can add. So stay tuned. Uh, Andrea's listserv is the best way to stay up to date. Great. Thanks so much. Um, question about um, the, the conservation of uh, insects through the California Endangered Species Act. Um, what's happening on this front, Jen? Um, and uh, I'm happy to take this if you don't want to. I think you can do it. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a fairly specific question, but there is an open question about the whether our State Endangered Species Act applies to insects, not just plants and animals. And there was a recent uh, court case that found that the state law does not apply to insects. And so the uh, Fish and Game Commission, which has jurisdiction over this question, is currently evaluating whether to appeal that decision legally. Uh, so stay tuned. I think the appeal window is fairly, uh, fairly uh, close at hand. So you'll uh, understand more if that appeal is happening. Um, but I think more broadly, you know, we want to again with the, you know, the biodiversity effort, the biodiversity collaborative is not about reducing the importance of the state or federal endangered species act, but it's trying to protect more of uh, the ecosystems uh, in advance so that we're not in the situation of needing to apply the endangered species act. Um, I'm trying to make sure that these are, uh, these are spread around uh, to everybody here. Well, Peter uh, asks, you know, what is the Secretary's statement for Black History Month uh, this year? That's a really good point uh, that you make. And, um, and this is why these forums are so important because you know, part of our recognition is listening and learning and identifying where we can be more proactive. Um, so perhaps I should have started by saying, um, you know, I wish everyone a good, happy Black History Month. This is, an, in my experience, Black History Month is an opportunity to uh, identify, elevate, celebrate, amplify the contributions of our African-American communities and leaders uh, to the work of our agency. Um, and I want to use this opportunity to highlight uh, a member of our agency that maybe if you don't live in Los Angeles, you might not be aware of, but that is the California African-American Museum, or CAM. CAM and the California Science Center are based in Exposition Park in South LA. They're free institutions. And I have to say CAM is one of the leading institutions on African-American uh, culture and history in the country. So if you haven't had an opportunity, one, I, I would invite you to, to visit. Um, we uh, are disappointed that CAM and the Science Center have had to be closed for mo most of the last year as a result of the pandemic, but we're really excited to those reopening. And we've talked with um, CAM leadership about doing more virtual uh, events. We did, uh, I think, a couple uh, in the middle part of last year, but really trying to expand access to CAM beyond just the physical location uh, in Los Angeles. Um, so Peter, thanks so much uh, for bringing that up. Um, another question, um, what is the status of this expansion of the California Advisory Committee on Geographic Names? Um, we have offensive names in place that need to be replaced. Thanks, Jane. So this is, um, let me try to explain this in a, in, in a not too obscure manner. Believe it or not, place names in the United States that show up on maps get approved by the federal government. And the federal government has a consultation process with each state. So many of the names, whether it's um, a road or a mountain peak or a river, actually made it through this very obscure process. And what we realize in California is we have an inherited discriminatory names um, as a result of that historic process. For example, Jefferson Davis Peak in Alpine County 
named after the Confederate general, no personal connection, but um, identified uh, back in you know post reconstruction um, uh, as as Jefferson Davis Peak. Um, we utilized the that body that Jane named that committee to actually recently uh, change the name or recommend that the federal government change the name um, to a place name that was identified by the Washoe people or the Washoe tribe. Um, that has uh, that area as its ancestral, ancestral homeland. So to us, that opened this opportunity that we should be doing more of that. So we announced uh, several months ago the expansion of this committee to include a more diverse set of leaders uh, and evaluating these place names, more transparency of the committee so that people could understand just what's happening and what names are being evaluated, and a more significant tempo of its work. Uh, and my colleague, uh, Lizzie Williamson, is our key point on that. Um, what I can say by way of update is we are getting those new members, um, many of which are recommended by various caucuses, like the Latino caucus uh, or the African or Black caucus in the legislature. We're bringing those members on, and we're planning more, uh, more meetings uh, this year. So I would say um, more to come. Stay tuned on actual place names uh, changing. Um, let me keep on going uh, for, uh, for Nancy, question from Abdul. Um, is there a plan to institutionalize the water resilience portfolio actions on a long-term basis such that they're continued and implemented over time from one administration to another? Ooh, excellent question. Yes, it is, Abdul, and you're going to be part of it. So <laughs> the way I see it, that the institutionalization of the water resilience portfolio shouldn't have to be a formal thing. I think it will happen on the natural if what we've done is produced a good product and we build interagency partnerships and uh, cooperation as we need to do to accomplish so many of the actions in the water resilience portfolio. The portfolio that we developed builds upon Governor Brown's water action plan because there were plenty of worthy initiatives and ideas in it. So hopefully the next administration, we can't dictate what that administration will do. But if our ideas are worthy, hopefully they will continue on and people, all the hardworking people at DWR and CDFW and the State Water Board and CDFA who have been part of trying to carry out the actions in the portfolio will continue that work and see the value in it. That's my hope. That's, that's really helpful. And that also speaks to the partnership with the legislature where you know, certain things need to be codified uh, and are in danger of um, shifting administration to administration. There's always an opportunity to codify them. I will say there's a lot of, there's a lot of continuity between the water action plan in Governor Brown's administration and, um, and this water resilience portfolio, but it's an excellent question. Um, Question for maybe I'll, uh, Angela, this is a tough one, um, but you or I could answer it. Maribeth asks, we need to have an, uh, uh, must have a discussion regarding expanding access for all. Uh, many who work in you know, managing state, bonded, state bond funded grants often have our hands tied by certain um, requirements uh, put in place by our control agencies. Um, access is critical, critical, especially as highlighted during this pandemic. Uh, there needs to be a, a, a clear path forward to make sure that our bond funding is going to expand access. Do you want to take that? Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Yeah, I'll start, but Wade, please jump in. So first and foremost, I'll say, Mary Beth, uh, we want you to help us uh, identify these types of critical barriers to access, because honestly, um, it's not, uh, you know, access for all Californians isn't just making sure that, you know, our most beautiful parks and our most beautiful places are preserved forevermore, which is a wonderful thing. Um, but we also want to make sure that every Californian has access um, that's, you know, safe and reliable and close to their homes. And so exactly to your point, our investments um, as a state need to reflect that priority as well. And so um, completely agree with you. The challenge is, is um, pretty significant when it comes to all the different rules and regulations that we do to ensure that our, grant, our grants and bonds you know, are properly used. And so what we want to do is come up with a bunch of creative solutions as part of our access for all agenda um, that we will be working with people like you. Um, and so um, I do want to invite you into the conversation and, and help us identify not only those tricky spots, but maybe some of the workarounds that you've been able to, to do 
um, with your partner organizations um, to see if there may be some pilots that we can um, start to do to sort of see ways that we can seed funding, that we can coordinate um, different processes so that, you know, if you're a wonderful person in a wonderful community here in California, that you have access to all the different types of funding that can help you bring, um, you know, the outdoors to your community in um, a way that's uh, easy and straightforward. Um, what I will say is, um, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here for uh, this types of, of sort of collaboration, um, as well with our new federal partners, as well as our um, local uh, in-state partners as well. So um, a plug to all of our uh, partners from those places as well. Thanks. And we tried to get through as many questions as we could. Um, unfortunately, I want to respect everybody's time uh, joining today. I will. I do want to make a point because Jennifer and some brought up just the need to address funding shortfalls, particularly in the Department of Fish and Wildlife, given that they went through a three-year process with service-based budgeting. So Jennifer and company, you have my commitment to identify what are solutions that we can advance this year on that front. Um, likewise, so many other good questions uh, and recommendations. Um, we will try to do this again, um, recognizing that there's, there's a lot of interest, judging by about 750 people joining, um, plus a lot of really good questions uh, and suggestions. So let me start or end, I should say, like I started, which is to thank everybody. Uh, if you're an employee of this agency, you have been resilient and perseverant and incredible over the last several months. Um, we're certainly uh, not, not out of the challenge we face, but brighter days are ahead and looking forward to getting back together all in person when it's safe. And if, you, if you're if you joining and you're not part of state government and not part of our agency, huge thanks for the work that you do. Um, you know, state agencies are a very small slice of the pie in terms of those that are bringing solutions to all of these challenges. So look forward to working with you all in the coming months and years. Thanks.